Right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll open up. Father, just thank you for this opportunity to gather again, to open your word, uh, to study, see what you have to show us today, God. Uh, open our hearts, open our minds to receive uh, what you have for us to learn today, God. God, lift up uh, Brother Bobby as he continues to heal. So happy that he is able to come home today, Lord. Pray for Shannon as uh, she approaches her surgery, God, that you would calm her fears ease her anxiety, uh, fill her uh, with your spirit of peace and of comfort. Uh, God, uh, we, we pray, we pray uh, for our nation's leaders, and for our country. You know, we pray uh, that people would be receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, that people would see themselves not necessarily in the way they normally do, but they would see themselves as sinners in need of grace, and they would turn to you. God, this is the, the burden on our hearts, and, and we pray that uh, um, your justice and righteousness would be seen in the days, weeks, months to come. And we pray for, for patience um, with all of our leaders and within ourselves, God, we pray as we continue through this summer and uh, we try to get back to uh, some type of normal that you would guide and direct us by your know, wisdom and uh, you know, we, would, we would stay true uh, to winning people for Christ and ministering to all. We would keep that in our hearts and in our minds and in our focus, God. Uh, we pray for those who are unable to, uh, to meet with us, Lord, that you would uh, uh, be with them and uh, guide and direct them. We just thank you uh, for who you are and everything you've done in our lives. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're in Nehemiah chapter 5. We we're moving right along. Uh, Nehemiah has felt the call of God and faithfully gone back to Jerusalem. And they are rebuilding the wall. He's uh, experienced opposition already. Last week we saw a little bit of opposition from inside the camp. And uh, this week we're going to see some of the same issues within the people of God. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's always bad when churches have those issues within the church that divides them and, and splits them. And, and it's a terrible, terrible time. It's a terrible thing that happens. And so we, we got to have that kind of unity. Tonight, specifically, we're talking about money. Talking about finances and faithfulness. That's what I titled this. This is where, where Jack would say, I'm going from preaching to meddling. This is where, you know, when you start talking about money, right? You say, hey, wait, wait a minute. Now. Right? So, and, but there's a lot going on here. Um, there's different interpretations of this chapter. Uh, it's been taught many different ways before. Um, many scholars disagree on what the chapter is actually teaching. And so we'll go through this as faithfully as we can and uh, see what, 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 it, what we find here. Um, John Piper, um, in, in regards to uh, finances, he, he wrote a book called Let the Nations Be Glad. And, and in there, he, he says this, in wartime, we spend money differently, right? In wartime, we spend money differently. There's austerity, not for its own sake, but because there are more strategic ways to spend money than on new tires at home. Okay, I'm quoting him here. He continues later in the book, and he says, a $70,000 salary does not have to be accompanied by a $70,000 lifestyle. He says, no matter how grateful we are, gold will not make the world think that God, our God is good. It will only make people think that our God is gold. That's what he says. Now, I, I agree with him on some, some, some points here. I think there's a point to what he's saying. Obviously, you know, he says, you know, there's more strategic ways than selling new tires at home. Well, if I, my car needs a tire and it's the car that Carrie drives and the boys that Riley drives, I'm fixing the tire, right? And, you know, there's, there's common sense that goes, that goes with this, too. And so I understand what he's trying to say, but at the same time, we have responsibilities. And then there's things that we need to take care of at, at home as well. Uh, you know, he starts off in wartime. And, and I kind of think of that. Because when you look at Nehemiah, you, know, you could almost say Nehemiah was a millionaire. Nehemiah had everything he wanted at his disposal. And we'll look at that in a minute. We'll look at just how much money he probably had in a minute. But he lived a different kind of lifestyle 
appropriate to the money. He wasn't ashamed to have the money, right? There's sometimes there's an overarching sense in, in the church that there's, you can have too much money, right? Or there's, there's another sense from some people where, you know, if I only had $5,000 more a year or $10,000 more a year, then, then, I, then I would be okay. But there's always this sense, you know, the person that has worked and been blessed with that money doesn't need to be ashamed because they've worked and earned that money. And there's also a sense that that person that has what God has given them needs to be content with what they have, right? So we have this kind of, kind of pool. And that's, that's what we see when we, when we come to this text here. Um, I believe the overarching teaching of the Bible shows us we need to be content with what we have. Um, those that have more shouldn't be feel guilty about it. Shouldn't be made to feel guilty about it. Uh, we know we're not to have a love for money more than God, right? The Bible tells us this. We know the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. Jesus tells the man in John chapter 3, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God, right? But very specific, the conversation he has with Nicodemus. Well, then if you go to, to Matthew or Luke, then he, you see him telling a young rich ruler, you can't inherit eternal life unless you sell everything you have and give it away. And, and, and so you have people that kind of pull on both ends of that, that kind of spectrum. And uh, then we see the story of Zacchaeus. A wealthy guy, a tax collector. Jesus, if you read through the story, Jesus never tells him he needs to sell what he has or to give back what he has, but Zacchaeus gives back about half anyway. And he does it, it says, because of his faithfulness to the Lord, because he loved the Lord. He felt convicted, and that's what he did. So, I, you know, there's this, this, this sense that we're supposed to sell everything we have and give to the poor and give it all away. Um, but then there's a sense we need to be content with what we have. We really need to use what we have for the building of God's kingdom. Right? That's what Nehemiah does when we come to there. Um, there's another quote. I think it was John Wesley. I don't think I wrote it down here. Maybe later. Um, John Wesley was a great Methodist preacher back. I think it was in the 16, 17 numbers. And he, he gave a sermon, um, The Use of Money. He, he basically summed up his whole sermon and, you know, earn as much as you can, save as much as you can, and give away as much as you can. And, and that's really a pretty solid Christian principle uh, to follow. That's a balanced view of, of Scripture. Um, just because um, somebody lives in poverty and sells everything doesn't mean they have more status with God than somebody who doesn't, Right? Um, but how we use our money certainly determines our obedience to God. Um, we have to steward wisely what he's given us out of reverence to him. We need to know how to steward what we have for his glory, for the building of the kingdom. Remember chapter 1 and 2, we saw Nehemiah as a, a man of prayer, a man of Bible study, a man of action according to God's word. Faithful to God's word, chapter 3 and 4. Someone who led like Christ, putting himself in the middle of everything and leading all of these people to rebuild. And then the wall there in the midst of opposition, chapter 5, we find out how wealthy he was, but how obedient he was. He's not ashamed of it. He stewards things in the proper way. So as this unfolds in this chapter, I've kind of broken it down into three parts. So the first part is this. The first part we're going to see is the cry of the people and the cry of the unfairness of their situation. Okay, now remember, this is not, uh, these are God's people. These are, are the Jewish people. This, this is who this is talking about. It's not talking about the pagans living in the other lands. This is the Jewish people there in Jerusalem that are working on the wall and helping to rebuild. So um, we see the unfairness of their situation. Not just that, but the disobedience of others within God's people is what we see. The second one is this. We see how Nehemiah addresses the situation. And the third one, we see how, um, what, how wealthy Nehemiah was, but also what he really wanted to be known for. What he really wanted to be known for. You know, I've met people uh, in my life who grew up with really nothing. And so now, as adults, uh, they're working day and night 
to earn as much money as they can for their children so their kids will have all of the things that they never had. And, and the conversation, and, and, and in the conversation, we always find out you know, what the kids really want is your time. They want, they want their dad. Eventually the money will run out, right? Eventually that's going to end. Somewhere down the line, you can have all the greatest investors in your family that you, that you want. Eventually, somebody's going to say, I don't want to deal with this and I'm going to spend it. Something, something along those lines. We see that here. Um, we saw this in Virginia. We, we see that here. We see family farms being sold, property being sold, right? In our community. It's been in the family for a long time. And people are selling this and their children are doing other things. They, they don't really want to farm the land, so they're just going to sell it and move on. So all that's been acquired over the time, even though it's been in the family, eventually it's going to kind of go away. So we'll see what Nehemiah really wants to be known for. So the first part of this, the cry of the people. This is verses 1 through 5, okay? We know all the people are working on the wall, right? We just finished with the fact that they, in chapter 4 that they're all working with their families who are all armed while they're working to be protected from one another. Now we find out, uh, verse 1, the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous, but in order for us to eat and stay alive, we, we, have, we have to get grain. So obviously there's a situation where they weren't able to get food. Well, remember, all these people came back to their own land, right? They had property, they had land, and they're, and they're, they're upset because they're having trouble getting the grain. Verse 3, others are saying, look, we're mortgaging our fields our vineyards and our homes in order to get the grain during the famine time. They're mortgaging it. The word there means to make securities or bargain. They're borrowing against their own property is what they're doing in order to afford buying grain. Why do they have to do that? Well, they're not able to work the fields because they're busy building a wall, right? So now they're having to get other people to work their fields or they're having to borrow against their fields selling to somebody else who's charging them interest on the money that they're borrowing in order to pay people to work their field. You understand the situation. Verse 4, still others. They're saying we have to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our field and vineyards. The king's tax isn't going to stop. He's not worried that you're having to borrow money. He's not worried that you're building this wall and he said it's okay but you can't keep up with your your field, you still got to pay the tax. Hey, we still, we have to borrow more money even to pay the tax on our fields. And although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we're powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to other people. Now remember, they're, they're talking about Jewish people. Their fields and their, uh, are belonging to Jewish people. They're, they're not, this isn't outside payments. Their, their sons and daughters are having to work as bond servants and household servants and slaves with other Jewish people in order for them to make ends meet and feed their family. Okay? It's not a, uh, it's a problem within God's people. Okay? And to say it another way, it's a problem within the church. Okay? Where, where people in the church are taking advantage of people in the church. Right? We should be working together. We should be helping one another. Remember, they're all working for the same cause, but they still find themselves in different classes. They still find themselves in different situations. The outcry comes Jews against Jews. The problem comes with how people uh, act and behave towards their own. To fully understand this and how we apply this, it's, like I said, it's how we act within the body of Christ. You know, they, Deuteronomy, where the law comes from, mostly for them, you see this in Leviticus as well, and uh, some in Exodus, you find some laws there too, but Deuteronomy 23, 19 through 20, it specifically says this, this, this is for God's people. This is the law that was given to God's people. Do not charge your brother interest, whether on money or food or anything else that may earn interest. You may charge a foreigner interest, 
but not a brother Israelite, so that the Lord your God may bless you in everything you put your hand on to in the land that you are entering to possess. God has called these people out. You're my people. This is how I want you to behave, right? Not, not like the foreigners. You're to be an example to how they're supposed to live too. But this is how God, this is how my people should behave. And it seems like with all the work on a wall, many of the fields have gone unworked, so people just don't have time in order to work the fields, to have food to eat, they gotta find somebody else to do it. It means they gotta pay them. They gotta supply for them. They have to mortgage and borrow against their own fields to pay for the, the king's tax. It's crazy, it's a rough time, right? You wanna be obedient to the Lord, but it's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult. You know, there's this, there's this, there's this overarching uh, thing in the church today. You know, you, you gotta give me 10%. You gotta give me 10%. And what happens is for a lot of people, they're, really, they're just not able to do it. They're not able to give 10%. They're not able to give, they can't give that, they're not gonna be able to give above. And so typically when I counsel people, I said, we gotta start somewhere, right? And, and, and yes, there are times of sacrifice, but not, not when the car needs new tires, and not when your child needs baby formula and diapers, okay? God, God will bless you, and there will come a time when you will be able to be blessed by this. You know, there were times for Carrie and I in the church where, where we needed help from people. And, and now there's times where there's other people in the church that need help from us, and where God has put us in different situations to be able to help one another. Within the church, we have we have a benevolence fund here in order to help people, right? And, and we help people sometimes outside the church. We try to help people, but we try to counsel with them and talk with them, and we try to do it intelligently. Um, you know, if somebody comes back every month and, or every three months, they they never enter the church, but they always need their electric bill paid. Then we they eventually say, we'll counsel with you. We'll look at your budget, but we can't keep doing this, you, you, you know. Um, but with people in the church, we can try to help each other as much as we can. You know, a lot of, a lot of that gets funneled through the deacons, and, and a lot of time, quite honestly, even when it's a, when it's a church member and stuff, typically I will I'll talk to one or two deacons, usually a treasurer, just Dennis, and we kind of make the decision and take care of it. And, and we, we know where the money comes from, we know um, how, that, how that's being worked, but some, sometimes for some people it's embarrassing. You know, but where else are they going to go? I don't want people without water. I don't want people without electricity. I don't want people without a home. And God has blessed us, and we are we're part of the family of God. We've got to take care of each other. That's it. It's supposed to be community. You know, there's there's uh, there's some things that the Amish and the Mennonite people have right, and, and they take care. of of each other, you, you know, and I think a lot of a lot of people today, a lot of churches today, can learn a lot from that type of community that they have. Uh, it, it's almost a sense where, it, it, at a point where it's almost like I, I don't really own everything. Everybody knows it. If you need it, it's yours. I'm not worried about getting it back because I can. Bob over here will let me borrow it. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It, that's the sense, the sense of community where you're helping people and taking care of each other. That's what the, that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. Um, and it says, for others, they had to sell their children and the debt and slavery within their own people. That's awful. I mean, that's just awful. Uh, when, I, when I read that, they weren't, these people weren't thinking about their, the effects of their actions on their fellow countrymen. The ones that were doing this. They certainly weren't thinking about God's word that said, what, don't charge your brother interest. Right? Help each other out. Um, you know, quite honestly, it's not something I've really thought about uh, too often. Uh, you know, I, we tend to look, I'm not taking advantage of it. I don't feel like I'm taking advantage of anybody. But am I really utilizing my time and my stewarding my finances to take care? It's something I just don't think, you know, I, I'm, I tend to compare myself to, you know, you got these guys on TV, sow a seed, 
do you feel the Lord? Send me a hundred dollars. You know, and, uh, you got me crazy. And these people become millionaires off of this. You send a hundred dollars, God is going to bless you. And, and they'll promise people more money and wealth. And people, man, people are signing checks over and mailing in. And, and, and these guys got ministries where they're, I need a new plane for, for the mission of God so that I can travel faster. No, the two that I've already got are not big enough. The two I have aren't big enough, right? They're, they're old models, right? Um, or it's, you know, it, it, it's amazing to me to see um, some of the homes that, that, that people live in. You know, I always thought growing up, I was like, man, I want this great big house. The boys, we do that. We drive around and they see this great big house. They're like, oh man, look at that. That's awesome. And I was like, all I see is a whole lot of dusting and a whole lot of vacuuming and a whole lot of yard to cut. That's all I see now. I'm, I'm like, I don't know anything. Put me in an apartment. Let somebody else do the yard work. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, maybe that's just part of growing. When you get older, you, know, you see things like, man, I don't have time to cut the grass. Maybe something, you know, somebody else can do that kind of stuff. But, um, it, it, it's, it's funny because the, the boys see it that way. And they can still, man, look at that place. Look at that place. I mean, this is, you think about the, the, the religion of, of Scientology. This is how Scientology started. You, you don't see old beat up cars in a Scientology church parking lot. Okay? Only the wealthy. It's only for the wealthy. If you can't pay, you can't be a part. You know, I, it was uh, L. Ron Hubbard who started that. Maybe y'all remember all the books, the Dianetics, and all that stuff that started coming out back in the 80s. And I think it was even before that. And, and, and he did an interview, I think, in 1990, 91. And they were, what's, what's kind of the driving force for your church and your religion? He's like, money, more money, more money, and more money. It's, it's, it's been compared to like a pyramid type of, of scheme thing. And it basically, in, in Scientology, they, in a nutshell, they believe you are immortal beings and you have uh, these negative things in your life that you have to get rid of. Um, called, they call them ingrams, and so, or ingrams, something like that. And so you go through this process of dynamics where you pay big, 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 big bucks in order to have counselors or psychologists or somebody in the church to walk you through this process of reliving these things and being released from these things that you can live a better life. And if it doesn't happen in this life, you'll be reincarnated to continue down the line. It's all about this. And the leaders there, that it's, it's all about the money. You drive down to Florence. If you don't take my word for it, you drive down here and just look at the parking lot. There are no cheap cars in the park. <laughs> okay? And, um, but that's, that's kind of how it goes. Manipulating people for money. When I think in these terms, though, like comparing myself to some of these people, I think, hey, I'm doing pretty good. Right? That's how I feel. But then when I read through this, yeah, I feel like I kind of have to reevaluate. Is that comparative religion? Compared to every other person. I always say, you know, that's our problem. We compare ourselves to everybody but the right body. Yeah. Right? We've got to compare ourselves to Christ. That's the only perfect person who ever lived. Uh, only money I know of he carried around came from the fish's mouth. Right? I don't think he carried any money. I mean, it's, give me the coin. Who's on the coin? Anybody got a coin with him? Right? He, he didn't pull it out of his. Yeah, when I compare myself to these types of things, I'm like, yeah, I'm good. You know, look, I'm doing all right. But then when I read through, that there is some conviction. Am I, am I do, stewarding the right way? And am, I, am, I, am I really pouring into God's kingdom and faithfulness um, with what he's blessed us with and given us? So, <coughs> excuse me. What comes next is uh, how Nehemiah addresses the issues. Starting in verse 6, it says, First, when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. 
I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. And I told them, you're exacting usury from your own countrymen. But basically what that means is he's causing debts. He's putting these people into debt. So I took, called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. And now you're selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us? They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what, are, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of the Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, houses, also the usury you've been charging them, the interest and the debt that they've been given. The hundredth part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. Give it all back, right? We will give it back, they said. We will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and I made the nobles and officials take an oath. He's not just going to take their word for it. He's going to make them take an oath to the priest before the Lord to do what they promised. Verse 13, I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, In this way may God shake out of his house and possessions every man who does not keep this promise. So may such a man be shaken out and emptied. He, he curses those who don't do this is what he does. You know, this is, there's this sense that... Uh, we don't have any right to tell anybody what to do with their money, right? Um, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but, you know, then, then this isn't just Old Testament stuff. What happened in the New Testament? You know, uh, Ananias, Sapphira, remember that story? They sold to give, and then they came to the church, to the synagogue, the people to give, but then held back some of what they were to give. But they were there. They could have held that back. And then when they did it, the church said, no, you got to we get out of our money. Could have been honest with it. That would have been fine. Yeah. Right. They, they could have been honest with it. You know, I had, um, I remember at our last church, um, just, just talking to the, 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 when the pastor was called there, they had another guy that they were going to call before him. And uh, they had asked about his finances. And he says, I don't, I don't have any debts. And, uh, everything's been paid off. And he's kind of left it at that. And, and so they did, they said, we're going to run a check on you. And he said, okay, yeah, no problem with the way he had no debts because he, his, his bankruptcy had come through six months before. And so, you know, it may seem like a small thing to him, but to those in the church, that was, you know, and, and when I talked to some of the people, they're like, we probably still would have called him if he had just told us the truth. We know people get themselves in trouble. And he says, honestly, at that point, we probably still would have called him, but we felt like, we felt like he was hiding something back. And so we proceeded uh, through the process until they found the next pastor. And uh, he was, is there anything in your background? He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, I, I got arrested one time for poaching lobsters. And they're like, really? He goes, oh, yeah, you can look it up. Well, it's there. You know, he just, I don't know, mental breakdown. I don't know what you call it. And he was at the beach, and there's a basket, and he wanted the lobsters. So he took the lobsters, and he got caught. And so, but he was honest. He's like, that was a while ago, but it's still there, you know, kind of thing. It's one of those days, that was before I knew Christ, kind of thing. And so, it was, but it was still there, but he was honest about everything. And when you're honest, even when you have those kind of issues, we're called to show mercy, right? Um, I've been really focusing on that verse this week, Micah 6, verse 8. This is what does God call good? Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, with the Lord, right? 
that, that verse has just been on the forefront of my mind uh, this week. That's what the Lord requires of all of us. Um, so here's the issue. Some of the people aren't able to work the land themselves. Um, they're working on, the work on the wall is going to suffer if they go work their fields. Now they've got rising financial burden to pay taxes, feed the family, and pay other workers. They're selling their own children. Here's what Nehemiah does. First, he gets angry, right? He should get angry. They're not following God's will. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. And then verse 7, he says, I pondered this in my mind. I pondered these things in my mind. I like the way King James puts that. It says, I consulted with myself, is what it says. And in the phrasing there basically means I brought myself under self-control. He was angry, upset, and got himself together before he addressed the officials and the nobles, collected himself, collected his thoughts, and uh, ruled his heart is what the, the, the Greek translation actually says. Then he accuses the officials. He calls them and says, hey, look, what you've been doing is wrong. You're exacting usury. You're causing debts for your people. You're not obeying the commands of God in your financial dealings. So what does he do? He calls them to repent. Verse 11, give it back. That's what, that's what, he's, that's what the phrasing is. Turn around, repent of what you're doing. Make it right. Get, get it back. This is the call to turn from what you're doing and obey God's word. In verse 12, they respond, we will do it. Verse 11, he declares that curse upon those who don't uh, keep their oath before the priest and before the Lord. How many people do you know have had experience with the Lord, have made a profession with the Lord, but as soon as they interfere with their lifestyle or with their money, that experience kind of disappeared real quick? Right? We see that in the parable of the seeds and the soils, right? Where people accept the word, but then when things get a little rough, they kind of move on. He declares this curse upon those that don't keep the covenant, those that break the promise with God. And at this the declaration, the people agree. They say, okay, hey, amen. At this, the whole assembly said, this is the end of verse 13. The whole assembly says, amen, and they praise the Lord. The people did what they promised to do. They gave it back and they made things right with their fellow countrymen. So now, what we see is the faithfulness of Nehemiah with what God had blessed him with. You know, if you, if you remember, we go back to chapter 2. Remember, he's standing before King Artaxerxes, right? The king says, why, why so sad? Man, you never looked sad like this before. Something's going on. How can I be happy, king, when all of my people are in ruins and defenseless back in Jerusalem? He's telling them. He asks the king for these things. And then in verse 8, because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. He's got the letters he needs. He's got the money he needs. He's got the army he needs. God has blessed him with all of these things, but he never lets himself get to a point where he's better than everybody else, right? Everything he's doing for is for the people. Look at the last verse of um, chapter 5, verse 19. Remember me with favor, oh my God, for all I have done for these people. Not because of the accomplishments on the wall. Not because of what we were able to finish and do at the temple. Not because of what we were able to do at the gates. Not because I was a good leader and able to get all these people to do this wonderful thing. Remember me for what I've done for the people. Right? That's what we all want to hear. Well done, that good and faithful servant. Right? This is something. Man, I, I read this. And the first thing that came to mind was, I hope in my last moment, this is the things that would come out of my mouth. Here, when I open my eyes on the other side, that this is what I can say. Remember me with favor for all I have done for the, your people, for these people. So he goes on here, verses 14 uh, through 16. Well, 14 through 19 is kind of the last section here. 
and we see Nehemiah's faithfulness and everything. 14 through 16, moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah until the, his 32nd year, 12 years, okay, 12 years now we've been at this. Neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. He's in charge. He's the governor. There's certain rights and privileges that come with that. There's a certain amount of food that comes with that. Never have I eaten it. Verse uh, 15, but the earlier governors, those that preceded me, they placed a heavy burden on the people. They took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to the food and the wine. And their assistance also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Not because he wanted the people to like him. Right? Not because he thought he would give him a better position out of reverence for God. I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on a wall. And all my men were assembled there for the work. And we did not acquire any land. Remember in chapter 2, one of the things he asked of King Artaxerxes was for the letters, for the armies, for the money. He said, hey, can, you, can you make sure I just have enough for my own place? It doesn't say what kind of place it was, but he had a place. We, we find out in a minute it was probably a pretty nice place, but he didn't use that to, he didn't abuse his power or his position when he did that. He acted out of reverence for God. We realize, realize how much he actually did, verse 17 and 18. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations each day. So he's rotating people in and out of his place in order to feed them. And he's saying, I didn't even eat any of this. How much was it? Here we go. Each day one ox, six choice sheep and some poultry were prepared for me. And every 10 days an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. And in spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the government because the demands were too heavy on the people. That's how much. How many years? Remember how many years? We just read it. 12 years, an ox a day and six sheep. I did the math. 4,380 oxen. 26,280 sheep. That's a millionaire budget in a wartime lifestyle. Every 10 days, as much as they want. And he said of all kinds, so there's only telling. Uh, you know, telling how much of that it was. Oh, oh, and some chicken. Or turkey or something, poultry. It just says, and some poultry. Everybody's got to have fried chicken, right? <laughs> There's always some chicken. Abundance of wine every 10 days. Either he had enormous herds or he had enough money to buy all this every day. And he was, he was sharing with the people. He was giving back to the people. This enormous wealth that Nehemiah uses was for God's work and for God's glory because he cared more about the people than anything else. This is devotion to God, is devotion to God's people, is devotion to God's work. And this, this is, this is, this, there is a spiritual discipline that comes with giving. Paul talks about that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, a little bit. When we talk about spiritual disciplines, we talk about praying, we talk about scripture study and meditation, we talk about fasting. At times, nobody likes to talk about fasting. We all like fried chicken. <laughs> I mean, nobody likes talking about fasting, but there's other spiritual disciplines too. And there's a spiritual discipline of being a good steward of what God has given us, right? He, uh, Paul talks about that. First Corinthians 16. 2 Corinthians nine is where we uh, uh, really get some New Testament teaching on giving, and it's the famous verse that most people: "Each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give." Not reluctantly or under compulsion. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Right? God loves a cheerful giver. You know, I have I have 
said in the past, and I will, I will continue to say, I do not really like designated giving. Um, I think God has equipped us with ministries and teams and people in positions, and we give, we should be giving to the church, and those people can kind of help and decide where the money goes. And I, I, I struggle. This is, this is just personal testimony for me, okay? I struggle with cheerful giving. I only want my money to go here. If it really is all God's money, then we should just give it to God. That's, that, that's my belief. That's my opinion on how things should be done. And, and what, what causes so many fights and arguments within the church? The same thing that causes fights and arguments within marriages, within workplace, right? Money is something that. Uh, but we're also supposed to give our time and our talents. Time and talents, absolutely. God's gifted all of us with gifts that we can use. And other places, I, you know, there were there was there was a time for for Carrie and myself where we just didn't feel like we could give. Financially to the church the way we wanted. It's, but for us, we were able to serve in other ways in order to use what God had given us to try to, to, try to make that happen. Um, we had a, a one church where I was serving, and, and we had a um, <clears throat> few people in different part time roles and uh, were being paid, and, and a situation came about where we just didn't have the funds to do that anymore. Came about very quickly, and uh, like I said, you know, problems in the church within God's people can, can really devastate a church. And um, yeah, there were a couple of us that said, "That's fine, don't pay us. We keep working. We're going to keep serving anyway. I'm going to keep on doing this because this is what the Lord wants me to do. That's fine." But we had others that said, "No, if I'm not getting paid, I'm not doing it." Right, and so that's their decision. I'm not trying to say that to say, hey, look, look what we did. It wasn't just me. There were other people um, that continued. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, teaching in a Sunday school class. Um, visitation. There, there's a lot of things in the church and people are gifted in so many different ways. Um, Charlotte, your hospitality is off the charts. It is. You so wonderful. I, I remember my first week here, you stopped by and you said, I'm on my dollar store. You need anything? And I was just joking around. I was like, the skills never hurt anybody. Is what I said. Next thing I know, here comes Charlotte with like four or five bags of skills or something. I, I think I was something like that. I was like, I was just kidding. I didn't mean to be pretty by skill. But I, was, I, I, I remember that. I, I remember those. I remember those things. I remember the, the meals that people have provided. Yeah, when, when Carrie was going through her treatments, and a couple ladies at the church had, had said, okay, we're going, she's going through treatments every other week on Thursday. And so every other week on Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, somebody showed up at the door with a meal. And they took the time, and it wasn't just casseroles all the time. They took the time to find out what the boys liked. They made sure that it was always something different. And Carrie, Carrie said the greatest thing. She said it was like it was like angels knocking on the door every night when somebody stopped by. And people were using what God had gifted them with to, to organize that kind of thing and to show hospitality and to show their love by, by just making food. Right? We think that's so, such a simple thing uh, to do, but it has a great impact on people. Just spending time. Look at some of the kids in our, in our church. Some of the kids that we minister to. They just want somebody to talk to them. And to sit with them. And to take an interest in them. Because they're not getting that at home. They get up. They've got food there. But they pretty much take care of themselves. They play video games or run around outside all day. And then, then nobody's really paying attention to them. I mean, Brian, 
Why do you think you got kids hanging all over you all the time when the kids are here? They know I don't like them. Because they know you don't like them. <laughs> it's because you joke with them and you play with them and you pay attention to them. That's why they're all over you. God's given you that, that, that way to serve. You know what I mean? I, I remember telling my mother growing up, I never wanted to help with the kids. Don't want to help with the kids. She, finally, she stopped asking me to help. She said, what are you going to do when you have your own? I said, I love my own. I just don't like anybody else's. I'll love my own when my kids are born, you know. What well, would God do to me? Be careful what you say. You, you're going to be helping the children's ministries, and you're going to be in the youth. And that all changed. My mom laughed at me. Physically laughed at me. I remember what you used to tell me. God heard that too. Right? I love kids. I love talking to them. I love sharing with them. Um, God's given us all something. You know? I could go around the rest of the room. God's given us all ability to serve somehow, some way. Um, just look at what, what people are doing around. That's a, great, that's a great point. Great, great point. Nehemiah sums it all up. Begs the question for us whether we want to be known for. Um, oh, here's where I wrote down a quote from John Wesley. <laughs> Earn all you can, save all you can, give away all you can. I know I wrote it down somewhere. I just couldn't find it in, 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 in my notes there. That's Nehemiah chapter 5. It's kind of a, you know, it's, a, it's interesting because you know Nehemiah. Oh, yeah, he's the guy that came back and helped build the wall. But you, you, if you don't go through it, you sometimes forget everything that was involved with that. Um, you know, you see a, you, you see a true leader, a, a true type of Christ, right? Who has taught us all how to, to handle our finances. Render Caesar what is Caesar, give the gospel as God's. We were to, to, to use our finances in a cheerful way, not under compulsion in order to build God's kingdom, right? Um, you know, when, when people really get that, man, you never really have problems, and you never have to, you, you don't have a sermon series on financial giving and things like that, you know? You may talk about it when you get to the text, but there's no sense of, you know, I've been in those churches too, where the deacons look at the pastor and say, I think you need to preach on tithing for you think that's a good place to be for a pastor? You think that's a good place to be for the church? You just need to take care of each other. You know, take care of one another. I've been so grateful for the giving of this church, especially during this time. Um, talked to 